Hi there, and welcome to episode 27 of The Green Room. And once again today, I'm joined by James. Hi, Nick. How you doing? Yeah, very good. How are you? Not too bad at all. Good. Not too bad at all. Exciting news today. I know, I know. We've got a guest. Brilliant. Brilliant stuff. We've got Alan from uh, London EPC. Alan, say hello. Hi, guys. <laughs> nice to be here. <laughs> Oh, it's great. So, uh, well, we're going to talk about a bit of energy efficiency. Yeah. Um, obviously, in London EPC, uh, there's a bit of hint in the title uh, about some of the things to come in today's episode. But what, Alan, why don't you just give us a quick two minutes? What do you do? What's your name? Where do you come from? <laughs> uh, well, my name's Alan. I'm, uh, I basically do EPCs in London. So, uh, everywhere inside the M25 we cover, we do... Uh, Domestic certificates, we do commercial certificates. You're, I'm going to have to say this, you're um, going to need to be slightly close to my phone okay, because sorry. I always get told off. Uh, <laughs> we do, yeah, we do domestic, we do commercial certificates, we do um, other types of surveys as well. Uh, we work with uh, domestic landlords who've got hundreds of properties and looking to update their, uh, their EPCs. We work with, uh, with people selling their properties and looking to get a, an EPC done. We... Uh, work with people uh, to make sure they meet their uh, MEES obligations. Um, lots of different stuff like that, basically. Every client's a little bit different and looking for something. Some of them just want an EPC as quickly as you can do it yesterday. Um, so some of them want you to go back and forth and work with them and try and get their rating up and get it as high as you can. Um, and, yeah, that's basically what we do. Perfect. Perfect intro. <laughs> Before we carry on with today's episode, James. Yes. Yes. I feel where, where very can, distant over there. Where can the podcast, podsters and the YouTubers, where can they the listen? podsters? Where can they watch and listen to us? So if you are wanting to watch us, we're on YouTube. Uh, all our episodes get uploaded there if you want to see us. Um, if you want to listen to us, you can go onto the Green Edge website and there is a little button that says podcast. A little button, I guess. A little area on top of the website that says podcast. Click on there. And you can listen to us on iTunes, on Spotify, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, uh, Podbean. Podbean, various other various other mechanisms. However you consume your podcasts, you'll be able to find us. So if you just go and you type Green Room uh, or The Green Age, uh, then we'll pop up. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's the way to do it. Um, yeah. And then uh, if you've got comments and questions, you can email us uh, at mailbox at thegreenage.co.uk or you can leave the comments in the YouTube videos themselves. Uh, sorry, I didn't even introduce Harry today. She hasn't got a microphone, but she can shout out. I'm sure we can hear her. Hola! <laughs> Excellent. She's just there to make sure that everything runs smoothly. And also, this proves that, because previously we haven't done this because we've been worried about space, yep. and Harry has never wanted to go on camera. But now, the fact we have a third person here <laughs> means that going forward, Harry may have no choice <laughs> but to oh, appear. Maybe for Christmas. Um, Christmas so special. We're groundbreaking episodes. Um, right, so let's crack on. So you talked a lot about EPCs, Alan. Mm. So you said it's you do them. How, how many EPCs, you can't tell me, how many domestic EPCs have you churned out? Uh, I, I, well, I, I don't know an exact figure, but I think it's well over 10,000 now. Blimey. Uh, well, yeah. And you, you lead a team, right, of assessors. Have you done 10,000 or your team have done them? I've personally done over 10,000 myself. Blimey. I have been doing it for, what, six, seven years now. So, okay. Um, yeah, been rack, racking up the miles. <laughs> so, the we're, so we're coming out with this acronym, EPC, mm. and you told us that we do, you know, do domestics and commercials. What does EPC stand for? It's, well, it's Energy Performance Certificate. Okay. Quite simply. And when they are basically giving an energy rating on a property. Yeah, so, um, yeah, any property can be done, domestic or commercial. Uh, and it basically looks at uh, insulation in the property, what type of heating, what type of cooling, um, other bits and pieces, well, like lighting, that's more important with a commercial, but there's other di bits and pieces that go into it, and it, uh, you, you plug all the information into the into the software, and it produces a rating, basically. And um, it's... Yeah, it's, it's quite a formulaic thing, but there's lots of different aspects to it that can affect the rating. So uh, you walk into a property and you don't necessarily know what the rating is going to be when you walk in there until you plug everything into the software and it produces the rating. You can get an inkling, but... Um, but these, so these things were launched in 2008, give or take? 
Uh, yeah, I think 2007, 2008. And, but they were valid for 10 years. So obviously there's a whole raft of VPCs that have come up for a renewal now because mm -hmm. after 10 years they expire, you need a new one. But there's also, you mentioned MEES earlier. Yeah. And that is another uh, acronym that people probably won't be familiar with mm -hmm. who are listening or watching. Yeah. And that now is really important, actually. So do you want to go into a bit more detail on that one? Yeah, so it's uh, the minimum energy efficiency standards set by the government. Um, and you have to now hit an E rating as a minimum uh, if you want to let a property. Uh, that's commercial and, and domestic. Um, if you don't meet those standards, then you're going to have to do something to improve the rating on the property or, or get exempted, um, which we can go into in a bit more detail. But um, that, that's basically you have to hit a certain standard to be able to let a property. Um, and when did they come into force? Uh, that was, I believe, last, I want to say last April. <laughs> yeah, Prince of Wales. So just April. over a year ago. Um, and yeah, it was not the smoothest uh, bit of government legislation. I can't believe was, uh, it. Yeah. Normally the government nailed this. <laughs> there, there were quite a few problems and we had lots of calls from very frustrated uh, landlords who didn't really know what was going on. Um, and yeah, it's been been a bit of a fiasco really but uh, I think things are sort of sorting themselves out now and people are understanding what they need to do um, but that's where we come in we're, we're there to provide advice for many years EPC companies are literally out there to produce a document uh, send it off as, as you know as quickly and as cheaply as they can um, and now things have changed a little bit the market's changed a little bit and uh, we've now got to offer a little bit more advice and go back and forth with the customer a little bit more because obviously it's very important for them that they hit those ratings that they need to hit. Okay, so I've got a question. So uh, does everyone have to have an EPC or is it follow certain, th certain things you need to go for an EPC? Um, you, you need one if you're going to let a property mm -hmm. or if you're going to sell a property. Uh, those are the two main ones. There's, there's some other things as well, uh, like if you trying to get some money off the government for various schemes like eco and the renewable heat incentive and things like that. But I'd say 99% of what we look at is for sales and, and rentals. But if, say if someone is looking just to kind of get indicative about their property, do you think it's still useful just to, even though they're not selling it, you know, for other aspects? Because presumably the EPC has a lot of good information on it. Um, I would say, uh, especially if, if you've got multiple properties, you've got a portfolio of properties, um, it can be useful to know you know, where you're going to need to be in a few years' time. It might be that you've got some in-date EPCs that uh, are, say, an E-rating or something like that, and you're thinking, well, that was five, six years ago. What's happening now? And, and landlords will get new EPCs just to make sure, they, you know, where they are and uh, how things are looking and, and budget for the, for the coming years. So we work with uh, landlords that have got hundreds of properties, and for them... They need to know exactly how much they're going to be spending on those properties over the next 10 years. So if they've got 50 properties that are F or they've got 10 properties that are F, that's quite a big difference in what they're going to have to be laying out over the next 10 years. So uh, it can be really helpful for them. For people who've just got a one-off property, um, I guess it can, can be helpful. It just uh, depends what you're looking for out of it, really. I mean, leading on from that, <clears throat> when we we were speaking previously to this, You've said that the EPC really favours certain types of heating. Mm -hmm. yeah? Yes, definitely. And so if I move into a flat with electric heating and I were to go and get an EPC, from what I understand, if I get an EPC there, the rating will tend to be much lower than if yeah. there was a gas border in there. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the big criticism that a lot of people, including myself, have at the minute, um, is that the government uh, is pushing, trying to push people away from gas as, as the way to heat the property, but... Unfortunately, the way the EPC works is that gas heated properties tend to get better ratings. Um, so if you heat your property with electricity, it might be better for the environment, but it might not necessarily be the best thing for your EPC rating. Um, so I do, but on, on, on this, you know there's that list of electric heaters that you that if you have one of those, your EPC rating is potentially higher. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a special efficient electric heaters. Do you think... The government, if they do try and push towards um, sort of electric heating, doing away with gas boilers, do you think they will make it easier for manufacturers of electric heaters mm. to be enrolled within the software? Yeah, that, that's another big problem. So there, there hasn't been a lot. That, every, every year there's updates to how the EPCs are, are calculated. 
Um, but it seems to be glacial in how they introduce new technologies. Um, and they have just made some amendments recently about how they look at new technologies, but um, things like infrared heaters and uh, uh, high energy efficiency heaters and things like that, electric heaters, just aren't really factored into the calculation. So uh, whether you've got a 50-year-old uh, electric heater that's on its, <laughs> on its last legs or whether you've got a brand new thousand pound ultra efficient amazing heater they're going to be put into the software in exactly the same way so you won't get any benefit for them at all so that's quite interesting um, for you know landlords who are looking to improve their energy efficiency yeah. you know it's almost worth getting or giving you guys a shout London EBC yeah before Absolutely, potentially yeah. investing in heating systems that have been they've been told these heating systems are incredibly efficient yeah. they install them you come out and do the survey and they're crap essentially it's something we see really often unfortunately and landlords get very shirty when they you know they've been given the sales pitch about how amazing these new heaters are uh, they'll spend sometimes upwards of ten thousand pounds putting in uh, new heaters and then we come out and the ratings exactly the same <laughs> uh, and yeah they're not very happy so for the sake of uh, what we charge 55 65 pounds for, for an EPC on a domestic property um, it's money well spent if you're planning to do extensive works um, and you're planning to let a property then definitely worth getting an EPC done to start with and then we can give you advice on you know what, what's the best thing to install so, uh, yeah, so I had an interesting, what, following from James said, so I had a comment from someone who called, called us up and said, oh, you know, I've had someone come out and do an EPC, but I've, um, you know, I've invested all this money in a new, brand new kitchen and, you know, I've yeah. upgraded my bathroom, I've got eight rated appliances, why hasn't it um, yeah. up my EPC score? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, misinformation and, and lack of understanding about how they're calculated. So the EPC is purely looking at the fabric of the building, and, and what what's heating and lighting the building? You're not looking at things, appliances, yeah, appliances fridges, and that sort of thing. Anything that can be moved out the building is not factored in at all. So yeah, you can have a new kitchen, new bathroom. It's not going to make any difference at all. Have you? I mean, this is a specific question. Have you, have you heard of Fisher heaters? Yes, I have. And are they in the software? Um, no. So they they go in exactly the same as any other uh, type of heater. Um, I believe there are um, heaters, I'm not sure, I'd, I'd have to check on Fisher specifically, but uh, there are allowances in the, uh, the new version of the, um, of the software that's just come out uh, where you can add in uh, information about certain types of new technology, um, but uh, as far as I'm aware at the minute, it won't make any difference to the actual rating on the certificate itself. So, and, and infrared um, heaters, are they any brands? Again, no, they're... Because I know Herschel... Yeah. Again, they're, they're not considered... They're considered exactly the same as a standard electric convector heater. So um, so if you have electric heater in your house at the moment... Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not picking on electric heater generally here, but the, the really the only way to increase the efficiency or your EPC rating, should I say, is to somehow supplement it with controls. Yeah, fair? so you, there will be an allowance of control. So if you've got an electric heater with no controls at all, just on off, and you replace that with something that has a, a programmer and a thermostat on it, then that will make um, a, a bit of a difference. We're talking maybe three or four points, something like that. On but the is it, if, if you had electric heaters that are plug-in wall, but they're permanent there, so they they are counted, if that mm. goes via a plug-in thermostat... Um, I'm asking plug in, tough yeah, do, they, do they count as kind of thermostats? Um, well, I'm just yeah. trying to help people, right? Yeah, because well, yeah. if you can get um, above, if you can get three points just by buying a few plug-in thermostats. Um, yes, I believe, I believe they would. Yes. So if you if you've got a um, if you've got a heater and you've got a, a thermostat, it doesn't matter if the thermostat is mobile. So for example, with a lot of people have um, uh, a programmer and thermostat that they can move around the house and take yeah. with them, uh, for especially for a gas boiler. Um, and that is considered in the software. So if you do have something like that for your electric heaters, then yes, it would be considered. Um, but it is only going to make a small difference. It's not you're not talking big, so um, big changes. There. I've got one more question on domestic, and then Nick is going to have some questions about commercial. Uh, I've actually got something, but go on. If you, if you, the top five things you can do. So if I move into a flat or a house, what are the mm. top five things I can do? I know they're not going to be relevant in every situation mm. to bump my energy rating. More than uh, me. Well, I, I put a proviso on that that you're talking about 
cheap and easy things you can do rather than, I mean, you, it, there's five things you can do to make every house an A, put a massive bank of solar panels outside, but that's not Well, always. let's do that after. So yeah. what are my five <laughs> cheap and easy? Um, so uh, loft insulation would definitely yeah. be number one. That's nice and easy, simple, and it makes a big difference on the rating. Um, heating, so if you've got an old boiler, um, definitely look at upgrading that. Um, you could could look at storage heaters if you've got standard electric heaters. Um, that that would make a difference as well. High heat retention storage heaters especially make quite a difference. And that's in there on that list, aren't they? Yeah, so if you've got electric um, heating, if, if you actually if you've got electric heating and you can switch to gas and it's easy to do so, then that can boost your rating as well, depending on what's heating the property. Um, if you're on a single rate electric meter and you don't have gas in the property, then switching to a dual rate meter will bump the rating up on its own. So that's definitely worth doing. That actually makes quite a big difference. So, um, but then presumably, if you were going to do that, you've got to put storage sheets in. Um, you don't have to. I mean, you could have uh, you could have a, an immersion tank with uh, a dual uh, dual tariff. So, yeah, a, you don't necessarily have to put in that to, to get the reward on the rating. Although, obviously, it would help if you put in the storage sheets with it. Um, so, that's my uh, cavity wall insulation. A lot of properties have already been done mm -hmm. uh, now, but if you haven't had it done, then that would bump the rating up considerably. Lighting, um, lighting uh, on residential properties makes very little difference. So we're talking really? one. Maybe so we've been points. talking a lot about LEDs and pushing. Yeah. That, so. so I mean, obviously, it's good for saving you money. It's another failure of the EPC, unfortunately, because you you will save money by putting in the LED lighting, but it's not really reflected in the EPC rating itself. We're talking one, maybe two percent on the final rating. And draft proofing. Um, uh, yeah, another one or two pointer that will make a difference. Uh, worth doing because it's really cheap to do and you'll get that couple of points. So, so if you're close so, to your EPC rate, if you the rating yeah, will get to light bulbs and drop It might just be enough. Out. So if you're on, say, an F37 and you just need a couple of points to get you over the line, that might be a good way to go. But again, just speak with your assessor because they'll be able to just check in the software in a couple of minutes and, and make sure that that is going to get you over the line. So is an EPC a bit conflicting because on, on, on the one hand... We're saying, you know, if, if you've got gas, because that's a, that's a cheaper fuel that counts to more, gives you a higher rating. But yeah, on the other hand, what James said, you might save a lot of money on the lighting going LED, but yeah. that's not going to re reflect so as much. That's another thing. When, when you're having a survey, if, you, if you're looking for advice from your assessor, um, make sure that they're aware. Are you looking to boost the rating or are you looking to save money? Because they're two completely different things that will give you completely different answers yeah. on what you're looking to to do. And so. under the EPC, do you provide this advice? Absolutely, yeah. Um, so we we'll give basic feedback on the survey um, as part of you know as part of the job. Uh, if you're looking for more detailed information, we can provide a proper uh, report and give that back to you in writing. Obviously, it costs a little bit extra, uh, but you know, we can provide a more detailed feedback and offer you uh, various scenarios of what what it will take to get you to a certain rating and things like that. So one, one more thing, uh, just to kind of describe the context of what these ratings mean. So if you just describe to, to the listeners what a typical F or G property will have versus one that's A or B. Uh, yeah, I guess we could give, give you some broad ideas. Uh, probably very little insulation in an F or G property. We're talking solid brick walls, probably no insulation in the roof. Might be a flat roof on a, on a block of flats, for example probably no insulation in there, so that would lower the rating. Uh, probably talking a electric heating or a very old gas system, maybe. Um, that's a typical f g property. The other stuff is could be on anything, but yeah, uh, th those would be the typical things you'd see in a, in a f a detached house versus... Yeah, it can, so it can make quite a big project. difference. Yeah, so you, you, the amount of heat loss wall that you have will have an impact on, on the rating. Um, but so, I mean, if a house is joined to another house, yeah, there's and they're both heated from either side. There's no there's heat less, loss. Out yeah, there. you've got less heat loss area to, to lose. Heat <clears> so that that will again make a make a difference. But you can have a detached house that's a, a B rating, mm -hmm. and you can have a detached house that's G rating. So it just depends. It depends on the other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But every every little bit all sort of adds up and produces the ratings. So and to get amazing rating, you're saying so bank of solar panels. Yeah. So I mean you. Uh, the actual age of the building is important. So if you've got a very modern property, it will be slanted to be a slightly higher rating anyway because there's certain assumptions in the software that we make uh, that mean that it's going to have a higher rating to start with. So having a newer property is going to get you a better rating for starters. Um, uh, the other thing is obviously insulation, obviously having a, a good heating system. 
but also having any documentation on uh, on things that you've done. So say you've got a detached house and you've got a flat uh, flat roof extension, for example. Uh, I would have to put that extension in as uninsulated unless you've got some sort of information to show that it's been done. So building control sign off certificate um, or a letter or some sort of evidence that shows that it it was done um, would would increase the rate. So basically, the more quality information you've got in your hand, yeah, the more credit you, the, you get. The more information we have, the better. So yeah, um, any information you've got loft conversions again, building control certificate is great because we can't get into that. Uh, roof space in a lot of times it's all sealed off in it. so if we can't see it we can't include it in the EPC so if you've got documentation that makes a big difference but yeah you won't see many A rated properties I get lots of people saying oh I've done this I've done that why isn't it an A um, it's probably less than 1% of properties in the country are A rated um, it's very very difficult to achieve uh, because it's not all new properties are built to an A rating that seems yeah, bizarre um, brand new properties should be pushing a, a, a very high B ratings, but um, obviously we don't assess those as uh, an existing Fine. building. Okay. So that would be for a new build. Uh, usually but new in build. 10 years you'll start assessing yeah, those. Yeah, we'll start assessing those. Uh, and the other thing is if you've got a property that was built 10 years ago and you're getting it renewed now because the, the, the new build EPC has expired, you, you should expect that the rating is going to go down a bit uh, because unfortunately we're not party to every little bit of information that the, the builder had when those were done. Fine. So yeah. Okay. okay. Great. So that's that's domestic. So moving on to on to commercial. Uh, in terms of so is the process of assessing different or the same or the actual survey itself is, is pretty similar. We're drawing a floor plan. We're looking at heat loss walls. Um, there's a few other things we do. So we, we, we zone it to, to look at different areas of the building. So if you've got an office space, you might have uh, you might zone it. One area is an office, another area is a, a toilet block, another area is like a kitchen, um, uh, shops. You know, you'd have a retail space and you might have a storeroom. So th these things get zoned out um, in the software. And then we look at uh, heating, lighting in the space. Obviously, a lot of commercial properties have uh, air conditioning. So we'd be looking at what type of air conditioning you've got, what sort of efficiencies there are. Uh, there's a little bit more to it, and as such, the cost is slightly higher to do. Um, and what, what takes you most time to, when you carry out a commercial one? Um, it's, a, it's a trigger, there's a lot more variety in commercials. So you've got, um, you know, we could be doing a massive 10,000 square meter warehouse, mm -hmm. um, but if it's a big open space with, uh, with no office there, then, that might actually be quite easy and simple to do. Whereas you've got an office block with 10 stories, that can take you all day because you've got to go through every floor and, and do a floor plan basically. So um, it is, it's very different to doing a, a domestic in some ways, but in other ways, <laughs> in other ways there's similarities. You're still looking at insulation, you're still looking at heating, you're still looking at lighting, all that sort of stuff. Um, some things will have more of an impact in a, uh, in a commercial. So lighting, for example, makes a big, uh, big difference in a commercial property. Is we, that just because they assume there's more lighting? It's, it's because, for example, in a shop, if you're mm -hmm. running a, an off-license, for example, you're going to have the lighting on all day long, whether the sun's out or not. So that lighting is going to make a bigger difference. Whereas in a domestic property, you're going to be out a lot of the day. Okay. Um, you're so only going to be switching lights on the shop. Yeah, it's just how you use a commercial property is different. That's, uh, that's okay. the main thing. Okay. So in terms of so what I get asked asked a lot is um, that particularly particularly since the the Mies, uh, regulations have come out for commercial properties is when the property is going through a transaction so I is going for the market so the landlord wants to let it mm -hmm. is say that the rating that the landlord's like well I'm I'm sort of worried because it's been stripped out and the rating's really low it might not pass me so then who is kind of responsible for the kit out yeah uh, that that is one thing that <laughs> creates a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, tension uh, it's it's definitely down to the to the landlord Quite pricey. yeah it can be very expensive so that it's down to the landlord to let the space um, if you've got a what we call shell and core so it's a it's a new build property that's completely empty and you're going to have a, a company come in there and fit it out for themselves then we can make certain assumptions on that and you'll get a fairly high rating because it's assumed that it's going to be fitted out to modern building control standards uh, with an older building that's empty and been stripped out unfortunately uh, 
you probably will get a bad rating. Uh, it's not necessarily going to be an F or G, but um, it, it will probably get a low rating. And that is ultimately down to the landlord. Uh, and technically, you, you can't sign a, a, a lease until it, it hits an E rating. So there's a bit of a catch-22 there about who's paying for what and such. And uh, I'm not aware that there's any real solution to that other than just trying to get through it Who's the best way you can. Yeah, yeah a case of maybe throwing in some LED lighting into an empty space and getting you over the line and then going in a bit. I've, I've heard, it's, uh, the one thing I've heard about the MIS thing, so it's minimum energy efficiency standards, is that, so, and it's, it's not written down anywhere, but it's apparently it is occurring, that I think for both commercial and residential, they there are if you are looking to buy somewhere and get a mortgage because at the moment means is only relevant yeah. to rental properties yeah but if i try and buy a house with a low epc rating yeah the bank is unwilling to give a mortgage potentially because if they were to repossess that in x amount of years they would be they would be required to bring that up to a standard to yeah. then be able to rent it so they don't want to have that risk so they want to take they want to provide mortgages to properties with a higher EPC rating. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, that... we, we see it. Yeah, we do see it, unfortunately. I mean, you, you can still have a cash sale. So in London, you still do get a lot of cash sales going around. There's quite a bit of money around. So you still get properties being sold at an F or a G, um, a sort of doer up as sort of things like that. Uh, and people will buy it in cash and do them up. But getting a mortgage on an F or a G rated property is becoming quite difficult. Um, a lot of banks won't do it. Uh, I can't speak for all banks. It's not a piece of legislation, so it's, it's not that uh, you're not allowed to get a mortgage on it. It's just that a lot of banks have decided that it's too risky for them, so they're not going to lend against it, mm. uh, which is up to them. <laughs> so, yeah, there's not much you can do apart from shopping around trying to find a bank that will <laughs> that will lend against it, I suppose. So if I'm... I'm As a buyer, anyway. Yeah, so if I'm, say, a, a landlord of a property, property and I've had, say, a tenant there that hasn't necessarily hit the... Uh, or sorry, so say they've renewed the lease, so say they've been there more than 10 years, so they haven't mm -hmm. come into contact with EPCs. Um, okay, that doesn't come... Well, kind of doesn't make sense, because <laughs> um, they've been in situ. Um, yeah. What, what um, an FROG, what, what kind of commercial property are we talking about there? What are the kind of features of an FROG? In a commercial property, yeah. quite typically you're looking at um, uh, the lighting on, on retail spaces anyway, office spaces, if you've got uh, halogen lighting, halogen spot lighting is really, a few years ago, was very popular in shops and things like that. Uh, and if you've got those in there, it will lower the rating and it's almost guaranteed to be a G. If right. you've got a retail unit um, with halogen spotlights or tungsten bulbs, um, it is almost guaranteed to be a G from the start. So in fact, what, when I get people call me uh, and they're, you know, if they've got halogen spotlights, I will say to them, just switch them out first. It doesn't take long. Put in some LEDs. You're talking maybe a couple of hundred pounds in a, in a small shop or something to switch those out. Mm -hmm. And you can go from a G up to a, a D or a C very quickly and very easily. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it will make a drastic difference. So, um, yeah, that, that's really worth doing. Uh, just switch them out anyway. And it will save you money as a shop. If you've got halogen lighting and you've got it on all day, it's going to pay back in about three months. So it's, yeah. it's worth doing anyway. Um, and then, I mean, just moving on from so obviously Mies and uh, the fact that the 10 years is up has seen a big mm. increase, I guess, in the number of EPCs yeah. that are being done right now. Are there plans by the government to further encourage people to improve the efficiency of their properties? Because Mies <coughs> is very much, yeah. it's not a carrot, is it? It's very much a stick. stick yeah. yeah. Are there plans afoot? Are they going to link it to council tax or...? Um, I, I, I am aware that they're looking to increase the standards that you're looking to hit over the next few years. So, so more stick. They're talking, yeah, basically more stick. So they're looking at uh, r raising it from an E to a D, uh, I believe 2025. I think it's the, sooner than that. Yeah, it might be sooner than 2023. <laughs> but so, it's, uh, but it's most, of these, up, so most of these got, are um, sticks rather than carrots, yeah. right? Because in yeah. theory, what they could do is say, you, and I, I know they'd need to do something with attached receipts on the other side of this, but if mm. they were to say, if you have a better energy efficiency rating, mm. you get 5% off your council tax. Yeah then it might encourage people to do it in a different way. You might proactively go and do these kind of things. And it's probably business rates on commercial, yeah? Yeah, that kind of thing. I just, I wonder whether, you know, we've, we've got these big aspirations now to be carbon neutral by 2050. Yeah. Um, and as you say, the government's, the way the EPC 
system is going is, uh, you know, they're going to try and push towards electric, mm -hmm. which is, I don't quite understand the rationale behind it, except heat pumps, which aren't always sensible investment anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, it just seems that we need something from the government to, to try and sort of push it rather than mm -hmm. try and beat people down the road. Character yeah. and courage. Yeah, well, unfortunately, we just sit at the end of the chain and we just have to make do with what <laughs> what the government tells us and we just have to follow their lead, really. But, uh, but yeah, there, there should be. There should be Cause some I, I don't know how big the market... I mean, I'm just, I know lenders do, do offer products. I'm always corrected by this. They go, oh, well, you know, there, there is energy efficiency products out there. But you don't hear it as, as an active market, James. You don't sort of hear, oh, look, you know, 20 banks have come down and they've got to launch this initiative to offer low interest finance to... It would be really interesting, right? And, and I think the, the other thing, I think if that unwritten rule, this unwritten rule about people not being able to sell houses with low energy efficiency, that if that suddenly became the standard and people actually knew that, then I think that would encourage people to invest. Because yeah. rather than being, for, you know, I decide to sell my property, rather than having to pay at that moment all the items to get it to that level, if I know I'm going to be in my house for five more years, for example, I then have five years and systematically over the five years I can invest a certain amount each year. Do you know what I mean? And it's not all suddenly at the last minute I've got to find this extra cash. The moving house isn't cheap, right? Yeah. Um, so it would be... You know, I just I think there are ways that the government could do it a little bit. But safer. listen, this is where the Green Deal thing was was fine in the sense that where it was linked to the property, yeah. Yeah. You know, whoever comes in, in theory, should be paying a little bit towards it because it's the benefit. But it was incredibly uh, cumbersome of a of a process for people to kind of uptake it on a. But I th so I think the fundament well one of the fundamental issues there were lots but one of the really big issues with the Green Deal financing mechanism because in principle it works right the person who's living in the house has to pay for the energy improvements yeah. but or the, or the tenant who is but if I'm I don't want to move into a house and take on some sort of debt that I have no I don't exactly know what it is mm. and I think that was one of the major failings of it I know what you mean about these kind of low, but I think I think, maybe, loans I, I think maybe that was in an environment where we didn't necessarily have the me's and then these unwritten rules, you know, about F or G properties and stuff. Because yeah. actually, if you had, so you moved in, but you know, as one of your, so you've got your paperwork, so you've got your say particulars, and then attached to it, it goes, oh, actually, you know, uh, a business case was done on property. Mm. It, it's it's had a new boiler, a new 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 windows gone in. It's cost fifteen thousand pounds. Now it's gone to a C, and the reason that was because otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be able to get a mortgage on it. Mm. So you might be paying ten thousand pounds more, which is going to mature in five years. But actually, there's something there on, in the paperwork, in the mm. particulars, to actually what you said justify why. Yeah. There's debt against it. Yeah. Um, and you know, if it's low interest, I suppose with energy prices, you know, going up and up and up. It will eventually pay for itself. I yeah, think. No, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, I think uh, well, to put the government ha hat on, as you were, as it were, speak from a government point of view, I think they would probably say these targets that we've set are actually pretty easy to achieve. You know, an e-rating is not hard to achieve. Um, so they, I think they might say, well, you know. Yes, you've got to incentivise, but at the same time, it, this is pretty easy. We're not asking a lot here, you know, to get to that rating. I think so. I'd say that completely depends. I mean, if you go and buy a property and you're completely financially stretched in buying a property, to then have to invest to get it up to a certain standard might be tough. You know, if I move into a property and I am financially stretched, well, if and you I'm bought, not going to be there forever in a day. If you bought a property, yeah, well, yeah, if you bought a property and you're planning on selling it in the near future, yeah, I guess so. But then you wouldn't have been able to buy it if it was uh, an, an F or a G, would That's you? That's true. You would have to buy it That's by true. cash. You know, if, if you can afford to buy a cash, then feel less property, sorry for then, you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Excellent. So do you do you think so? Just just going on what you were saying, James, about the move towards electric. Do you think? Well, I I, I think that the government. I've got it completely mixed up because the whole thing four or five years ago was about the fabric, and yeah. we, we know that you know if you target yeah, the fabrics, if you target the fabric, um, that's in theory going to give you the biggest uh, return, you know, in terms of energy efficiency and yeah. warmth and, and, and emissions, etc. 
So why have the government suddenly ignored all that and you know think, well, actually, if we take boilers out, and you know, and then we switch to electric? I did, so I imagine I d- if you look at it in the simplest terms, if you are producing electricity, if your own country is producing electricity, right, and the problem at the moment is we are importing lots of gas, which which is a fundamental issue. But if you are producing your own electricity from things like wind and solar, yeah. then it's not a bad situation because it's reducing our reliance on bringing on potentially a volatile... Volatile mm. <laughs> The price of gas is volatile. Yeah. Yeah, it may go up or down depending on supply and demand. So if I, as a country can produce all my electricity at a relatively fixed cost and I know what that cost is going to be for the next 20 years then life is very very simple Mm. and therefore it makes sense the issue at the moment is our current energy mix and I've said this a million times on this podcast is that we are producing lots of our electricity from gas that we're importing and while that is the status quo we have an issue but I can't believe in the next 20 or 30 years, we're talking about 2050, mm. all these changes are going to be in place. I can't believe that will still be the case then. So I, I pose you a question and hopefully you'll give me the answer, the right answer. Right. So if wind is intermittent, yeah. if solar is intermittent, mm. but okay, we kind of know where the price is going to go. Yeah. If coal we don't want anymore, yeah. and gas we don't want anymore, but yeah. we want an energy source that is stable, that is long term, and that that is is a baseline. What what other alternatives are there? Do you work for the Nuclear Commission <laughs> secretly? Um, no, I mean a nuclear nuclear kind of it does make sense as as the is your baseload energy supply, um, but you have nuclear waste to get rid of, and that is always but going to be the issue. It is, but why why are we scared of of commissioning research and projects in that area? Why have we stopped? Well, the, the reason, the reason for me that it's that we haven't done it for forever and a day now. It's been it's a long, long time. So Hinkley C is mm-hmm. sixty-year-old technology. It it is, but we have paid through the nose to have that. Well, that's what I mean. It's it's um, there. There's there's schools of thought out there. There's there's ideas that politically we're not hooking onto because I just think when you use the word nuclear, people get really upset. Yeah. What do you think about nuclear, Alan? <laughs> an environmental um, scientist, by the way, yeah, yeah, is that right? Yeah, yeah, a, a while ago. Um, <laughs> I, I think the the main reason it's not been done is the cost. I don't think it's anything to do with the nuclear waste. I think if it was cheaper, the government would be all over it, and we'd bury the nuclear waste somewhere. But it, but it uh, was the the thing was it was cheaper, but now the other technologies are coming down in price, mm. and I think that's what the gov- the government were. Uh, envisaging would happen and it has happened but anyway this maybe for another day we have this chat was well, one more, more thing was about exemption so Harry mentioned it uh, before the top of the show uh, there's so basically was it from April 2020 the yeah. government have said that if you've had so previously if you put money so say you've got a, an F or a G yeah. rated in your means we're doing minimum energy efficiency standards yeah and you've put some money towards it. Yeah. And then you've got a five-year ex- exemption? No. It's if, it, it, it's so... You're the, yeah. I don't you explain because I don't know if you're going to hear. So uh, up until recently, you were allowed to uh, uh, get exemption uh, without actually spending any money on the property. Um, and originally, I believe, that it was supposed to be a five-year exemption. Uh, and now we've just heard, uh, apparently, that um, it's, it's now changed. And if you've got an exemption... Uh, based on that, a no no cost exemption, uh, you're now suddenly no longer exempted as of next year. Um, so the government have retrospectively yeah, changed their minds. They've changed their minds. So they originally said you got five years of being exempted, and now oh no, actually next year you're not going to be exempted anymore. And there's supposed to be letters going out or emails going out to everyone who's got uh, an exemption, because you will obviously have your details on the register, so they'll be sending out a blanket message to everyone, I imagine in the near future, because they're supposed to be doing it well, That sounds time. like that might go into the courts. Um, I, I can see a lot of legal cases. Yeah. But, no, I, I, but I think, I think when they... Because I, I went into a, um, a sort of industry focus group slash catch-up, and they when they were talking about exemptions, um, 
they sort of knew that you know could come back to bite them. So although the government said five years wasn't really five years, right? Okay. So okay. well, we'll see. We'll see what happens because I, th- I think we need to wrap up there. So Alan, thank you very much. Um, and I'd, I'd say to anyone listening or watching, if you need an EPC in London, commercial or domestic, Google London EPC. And so, uh, london-epc.co.uk. There's there, quite a few imitators there out there with the original and the real ones. <laughs> um, and so if you're looking for a bit more advice, you know, the, Alan and his company are definitely the ones to go and speak to. Um, so thank you for coming. You're our first guest no on The Green Thanks Room. Thanks a um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have more guests in the future. And uh, anything else from you, Nick? No, that's it. I just want to thank everyone. And um, yeah, we'll see you. Harry, thank you very much. Thank mm-hmm. Alan. And we'll see you next week. Cheers. Cheers, bye.